then you may end up with that. Remember one thing in the 18th century, there was no such things as we know today, grocery stores. Today on the Taste of History, we are making one of George Washington's favorite dishes, real olives along with white beans and shallot puree. This happens to be a quarter of a wheel, what we call a wheel lake. And the reason I'm showing this today, there are two points to make. One is the fat that you use here. A lot of people know about the kidney pie, what have you, because the kidneys come right next to it. So this, kind, this fat here, the 18th century chef would have treasured and would have cut it apart to make sure that he saved it for his uh, next kidney pie he's going to make. Also, all the trimmings would have been obviously used a lot of mincemeat was done, uh, veal patties, the things we know, you name it. What I'm doing today is I'm going to bone quick to get the inside round that you're going to use for this particular recipe. Now, if you would do this today at home, you can go to your butcher and tell your butcher to give you a couple of veal scallopinis cut from the inside round, and you would have no trouble getting it. So here, I'm going to turn this over, and I'll go in here. And I'm just loosen up enough so I can get the inside round out. Now, once you debone the entire leg of veal, there are many different cuts that everybody uses. For instance, this one over here is a piece of the tenderloin that is very pressured. And we have a bunch of recipes where we use veal tenderloin as well. And the veal tenderloin is no different than the beef tenderloin, obviously because it's just a muscle. It has great, great flavor. Now, this would be the veal tenderloin buried in here in the fat. Gorgeous. So, and again, like I said, the fat would be, would be preserved for all kind of dishes that you make with it. Here you go. Voila here. Now, the thing I'm doing for this inside round, I'm just taking off a little bit of the fat cap. The reason you want the inside round is the, it's the cleanest part of the muscle of the leg. And you'll see in one moment how it looks like. So I get, I look for this uh, seam that you cut into it, and then we go right through it. Got a seam over here we're going to go into. This entire leg, by the way, is a variety of different muscles. There's one that's called the fricando, which is kind of difficult to use if you don't have it right. And here I'm going to get my inside round right out in a second. Voila. That's the piece I need to do my recipe with. Give me one more second, I'll clean it up real quick. Take the side off. Now, this piece you would use for veal stew, you would use for raccoufin, you would use for many different things. The veal has actually a cap on it, the inside round, that is very pressured for raccoufin, for different things. It has a lot of flavor, this, this cap right here. Just taking it off really quick. Here we go. And at the end of the day, this is what you want to end up with. This is this piece right here. It's beautiful. It's the best for veal goulash, for veal stews, because it has a lot of unique flavor into it. So I'm almost ready to get started with cutting down the veal scallopini that we use for the veal olive that, as I'm always amazed about Martha Washington, how she invented this dish. How you come up with an idea of taking the veal, the inside round leg here, and then developing it to stuff crab meat into it. It's to me still a very unique experience when I cook it because it's so, it puts me in perspective how much time and effort they might have thought looking for new things to entertain their guests. People say to me, well, was this dish actually served? Yes, it was served in the president's house. It was served on the uh, 6th and High Street before it became Market Street. And the biggest celebrated chef, I would think, of the 18th century would have been the chef who worked in for the president's house that you would now call the White House. And his name was Hercules Caesar, quite an eccentric fellow. I studied him as much as availability to study him. as uh, mind-boggling. Matter of fact, his picture hangs in the Prado in Madrid. Uh, he was very avant-garde. They said that he was one of the finest chefs around at the time because he had, we made love to food. He really had a, a, a passion for food. 
And the other thing was he also was of means because Martha Washington, having a good heart, because remember, he was still an enslaved uh, uh, chef at the time. He wasn't a free man. She let him sell the leftover food uh, in the afternoon or in the evenings when they were finished with their meals. So he had a nice little business going. Actually, he had himself fancy clothes. The picture shows him with a very beautiful chef's clothes. So he was quite, a, quite an interesting fellow. And I'm sure that he was told many times by Martha what he had to cook. Those recipes are all in her cookbook. This is one of my favorite of hers because it has a lot of flavor. It uses truffles, or it uses mori mushrooms. It has a sherry cream sauce on it. It's just a spectacular dish, as I'm going to show you in a bit. Come with me to 18th century Philadelphia to meet this great chef, Hergulus Caesar. When George Washington became our nation's first president, he took up residence in New York City. But by November 1790, George and Martha had moved to Philadelphia. Philadelphia was the national capital from 1790 to 1800. George Washington and John Adams each spent the lion's share of their presidencies living in this brick house here. And so where's the house now? Well, <laughs> many of the walls were torn down in the 1950s. We have found some of the foundations. This was the largest mansion in Philadelphia. It had been owned by Robert Morris, and he gave up the house to serve as Washington's presidential mansion. Did Martha and the whole Washington family live actually here? Martha lived here along with her two grandchildren, Nellie Custis and George Washington Custis. The household had about 30 people living here, 24 servants, and about five or six secretaries who lived up on the third floor and worked in the office. The front of the house was out about 19 feet off of the Market Street roadway. Yeah. Okay. And then you would walk through a passageway here, the piazza. Uh -huh. This led from the steward's room to the kitchen, which was ruled by Hercules, the enslaved chef. Hercules was given the right to sell the excess foodstuffs right. from the presidential right. kitchen, and that that netted him $100 or $200 a year at a time when an average wage might be about $100 a year. Correct, correct. G.W. Park Custis, Martha's grandson, would later recollect about Hercules that he was a dandy who would get dressed up in his finest after preparing dinner for the Washingtons and their guests, and then go out on the town, where people on the street knew him by name. Normally, if I give a big dinner in the city tavern, I walk out after dinner and take a bow. I think Hercules would be part of the kitchen to take a bow. First person accounts of people coming to the uh, state dinners, they, they claim that all of the servants were white so that uh, slavery was hidden within, from the public within the president's house. On the day the Washingtons departed Philadelphia to return home to Mount Vernon in 1797, Hercules was not to be found. He had escaped and was never heard from again. So welcome back. Wasn't it amazing to learn all about Caesar? What a chef, huh? Anyway, so now I have the inside round. I'm cutting, depending how many people you can entertain. For today, I'm going to make like three. Uh, I cut a small slice, not too thin, not too thick, just about like so, of that inside round. Now you know why I want to use this piece of meat to make this dish, or why Mother Washington picked this piece of meat, because it's the leanest, and it has no uh, nerves running through it. So it's beautiful to cut and very easy to work with. Here we go. I'll put it down. The next step is? I need a, any kind of a cleaver, if you will, or a hammer, whatever you prefer, a little bit of parchment paper. A little parchment paper over. All right. The reason when you use parchment paper, you don't want to ruin the wheel. It's so delicate. Delicate in flavor. There you go. So next we're going to do is a little salt and pepper. White pepper again here. I don't want to use the black pepper cedar sparks. Now, for the stuffing, she has several recipes in her book. And this is Martha Washington I'm referring to. Uh, one is a crab meat. The other one is an oyster stuffing, a shrimp stuffing, many different kinds. Today, I'm just using a crab stuffing, which is really the same crab stuffing that I make for the crab cakes. There are many more things to do, so I want to just concentrate on the other dishes that go along with it. What you want to do is you take a little, divide it up, depends how many you make, 
divide up the crab meat. Now, one of the things that I found that I said earlier, uh, when I make it for large parties, I sometimes find a little flour on the inside holds it better. So what I'll, what I'll do is just a little bit of uh, AP flour, just a little bit, sprinkle it over, not much more than that. It just adds a little bit more as a binder and holds the stuff in good. So then what you do, you just go and you roll it. Voila. It's no different than a veal roulade, like we use in the, in the Black Forest, or a, a, the Italians use a, a bressol. Same idea. The reason it has its name to veal olive is because once they cook, they shrink, and they look like a giant olive. It has nothing to do with olives in it. First thing we're going to do, we have a, a spider. For this dish, it doesn't need to be hot at all. So this happens to be Gushmalz, any schmaltz would work. It's rendered, rendered fat. Put them thing in there, roll them up a little bit. And voila, one. They're cooking about, depending on how much heat you have, about 10 to 15 minutes. So now I've got to find a spot on my fire. Let me organize the fire quick. As I always mention to people, cooking in the 18th century is just not about turning on a, a knob on your stove. You also have to make sure that your fire is properly positioned so you can, like in this particular scenario, put a spider in, making sure that I have enough, here we go, enough coal. Okay, here we go. Now you, what you want to do is you want to move it. This is your temperature control. Look at that, right in here. Because I want to get this now seared up. Okay, there you go. One thing about those spiders, they are wrought iron. So obviously the heat will penetrate really quickly. While this is getting ready, I'm going to get ready for another real great dish, which is the white beans. Jefferson fell in love with beans when he traveled to south of France. The beans, we call them in this country great white northerns. They have many different variations of names as they've been used in south of France. The best way to do it is, is, is when you have the beans, we pre-soak them, you can pre-soak them and pre-cook them, like those ones over here. Ideally, pre-soak them overnight, cook them for a little bit. I gotta keep my eye on my Villa Alice. This fire is really cooking. I have a small Dutch oven, I put the beans in. And the reason you make a bouquet garni, you don't really have to make a bouquet garni, but it makes sense to do it because so later you don't have to fish out the ingredients. So my bouquet garni here is a real straightforward one. It's uh, thyme, it's bay leaf, it's clove, it's peppercorn, and I like a little onion in mine, so I stick a little piece of onion in there. Here we go, wrap it all up, take a little butcher twine. Next we'll do, we have some potatoes. I'm gonna show you right now. Let me, I gotta bring the veal olive here for one second. I don't wanna ruin this dish. Hercules wouldn't forgive me if I would uh, not make it correct. Cherry wine in here right now. And I got some shallots already chopped. Pour a little bit in here. And back on the fire they'll go. And obviously I gotta keep a close eye on that because you see the temperature we're cooking over here on that side of the oven is about 800 degrees. Potatoes, two ways you can do it. You wanna peel the potato, but a lot of people, especially if you use the, the one that Thomas Jefferson preferred, the whites, the Irish whites, just cut them in with the skin. But if you prefer to Get the skin off, just peel them up, like I just did. Cut them in small cubes, throw them together with the beans, like here. And then all you gotta do is put some water in here. Salt, a little more white pepper, pinch of garlic. Now those ones here are cooking in overdrive, as you can see already. So I'm ready to put the lid on them. I'm gonna put a little bit more sherry wine into it. Put it back. Now if you have an oven and you don't have to cook like I'm cooking today, you can just uh, 
leave it in the oven, but covered. You don't want the wheel to be dried up. You want to cover that. Okay. Another thing about the researching all the recipes is that I was very perplexed with the sophistication of the sauces. The sauce that I'm making today is a sauce you would make any day today in any French restaurant, for that matter. It's a really beautiful, clean, but very del delicate sauce. And all you want to start off, for this sauce, for instance, I would not use any lard or schmaltz. No, I would use butter. And I would use butter as well. And I would use plenty of butter. And I use butter and I use shallots. And believe it or not, interesting as it sounds, the shallots doesn't get sweat down yet. The shallots get uh, drenched in sherry and white wine and put under fire. And when the shallots are kind of translucent, then it's heavy cream, a little bit Bourmanier. And the interesting part, think about that, 18th century, would use truffles. Jefferson fell in love with truffles, but also Maury. But the truffle itself is just a beautiful flavor that's going there. So now this pot goes right on my griddle blade over here. And actually, my beans are cooking spectacular. Let me go over here. The beans are perfect. Done in no time. This goes in here. And a little bit more sherry. But just imagine the flavor you have. You have the veal, you have it wrapped in the crab meat, you got the sherry wine, you got it reduced, you got it on a beautiful fire. I can just see why Mother Washington would have been excited making this or have her people making it for her. It's beautiful. Let me get this in here. What flames off is the, the alcohol of the sherry. And this dish is done. We leave it sitting right here till we get the sauce ready. When I'm talking about controlling the fire, what I mean is at this particular stage, I want to make my sauce. So what I do now is I'm do I don't turn the dial up higher like on a modern equipment. I got to get my coal and stick it underneath. Here you go. So that this baby can cook, which it will in no time. Okay, make sure it works. I have another spider here and that's where what makes the bean great. Perfect. So this one over here, I'm using, this happens to be gushmals. But again, you can use any kind of rendered fat. Plenty of this in there. Don't worry about how many calories you're having. It's all about flavor. It's all about the taste of history. And then I put ch uh, shallots in here. Now those shallots, I'm going to slightly brown. Because I want to get the flavor of those later to go on top of the bean puree. So I make room over here, stick it right in there. Okay. The bean puree, I already set on the fire earlier. Up. And how beautiful. It cooks itself almost through like a mashed potato. A little bit of green. Heavy cream, perfect. And this is the this is the accompaniment for the real olive. Many different dishes were cooked in what we call today into a mush or into a puree. And the reason for that is there was very poor dental hygiene. And that people that had money and were exposed to sweets suffered a little great deal with, uh, with their teeth. So as people had money and opulence, they had sugar and henceforth they had a little trouble. So that's why this comes in. Matter of fact, there's a lot of controversy about George Washington's wooden teeth. The, the scholars are arguing if he had them, if he didn't have them. So I'm not taking any side on that, because <laughs> George Washington was good to me. He obviously hung in the city tavern, entertained a lot of people, so I don't want to ruin this relationship. Anyway, my, my sauce is doing excellent. I'm just going to add the cream in it now. So you want to watch that. And the other thing is with the sauce, I have a little trick. And the trick is, here we go, cream goes in. The trick is, if you like a little more meat flavor than just cherry flavor, what I do, I said with a little bit of demi glass into it, but you don't have to. Any brown sauce will do the trick. It just gets a little bit more flavor into it. Brown sauce in here. It's already cooking. Let me take this off the fire for a second. Because that's basically done. It's a little bit more. This part over here. Oh, talking about heat. Okay, now the sauce is ready. All I gotta do now. Bourmanier, which is half butter and half 
all-purpose flour. So I'm taking the Burmagne and whisk it under the sauce. Thicken it up. And this sauce doesn't even have to go back on the fire, but it can. When I make the Burmagne, only thing to remember is equal part flour to equal part butter. It translates means actually hand butter. But look at how perfect it is. I have some parsley I'm adding into it. And the sauce is done, short of one thing, that I gotta do the, the truffles in a bit. Look at how perfect that is. Little truffle. Could use white truffle too, but not for this particular recipe because they wouldn't really stand up. Okay, let me see here. Yeah, they're ready. Okay, a bit of shallots right on top, plenty of schmaltz to go along, and quite frankly, I would think many, many 18th century folks, they would have been the meal many times. Protein, as we know it, was hard to come by, even in the early days. So here we go, parsley and there like so. And the little olives are ready. Yeah, sizzling good. All right, I put the sauce over the olives, put a little bit of shaved truffles on top, or just chillion of truffle on top like so. And now I can garnish it, so you can put a little, uh, little sage, a little parsley. I prefer a little parsley for this plate, so because it's already busy on its own. So we take a nice little speck of parsley, bring it right here. A little bit of chopped parsley on the other rim of the plate, and uh, the dish is ready. Today, I celebrated Martha Washington and her great chef, Hercules Caesar. Those are the recipes that she penned in 1742. I've worked with them, I've researched them, I've cooked them over and over, and I cannot say enough about Martha Washington. What a great lady, what a great chef, what a great inspired person to do things like we do today in modern cooking. I hope we inspired you today with a taste of history.